Hello and welcome to a special edition of Willow Talk. Adam Peacock here for a fireside chat with fellow co-host Elisa Healy. Had's not around, but Heels, how are you? Good. I mean, Had's a seat today. I don't know how comfortable I feel. No, I'm no. closer to the door. Stay right. Feel right at home. <laughs> he's, he's never here, so it's, it's your seat. He can come back in and find his own seat when he comes back. But our special guest today is Australian men's test cap number 313, and he's got that. Three one three zero 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 number of stories from his life in cricket and sport and TV and everything. Mike Whitney, Whit, how are you, mate? Good, Adam. Thanks for having me, mate. Midge, how are you? Very well. Very nice to be here. This could go eight hours, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> but you do, you're no stranger to podcasts. You've got uh, yourself on How's That, the podcast with Sugar Ray Nosty and Andrew Dawson. You yeah. tell a few yarns on that one. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. They, they, they said, why don't we do a podcast about 18 months ago? And I went... There's 43,000 podcasts out there like you've got to have a difference, an edge. Mm. So next minute they've got the little podcast thing that's only this big and you put an SD card in it and we got some mics and we started mucking around with it and it sounded okay. And then we decided, well, if we're going to get guests on, it's got to be like having a cup of coffee in a coffee shop or having a schooner in a, in a bar, that type of relaxed mm. situation. And that's what we've done and we've got some – Pretty amazing stuff out of some people who said afterwards, I've never spoken about that ever publicly before. Yeah. And and so the atmosphere we're setting and, and the timing's very important because Sugar Ray's an old mate of mine. We grew up in Matraville. He's a really funny guy mm -hmm. and he's starting to understand comedic timing, <laughs> which is a nightmare because he chips in with these very funny <laughs> comments all the time. And I've got this thing going with him at Ray. No, 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 no. If you listen, it's very funny. So cool. It's good fun. Look it up. Have Thanks for the plug, it. brother. No. <laughs> How's that? The podcast. That's look it, it up. Now, Heels, this is okay. Um, you came in here and said, okay, 1995, there was something on the rundown about 1995. And you go, how old were you then? Five. You were five. So this, <laughs> to me, I, I caught the age is a of, bitch, mate. I'm telling you. I was born 78. So I missed the start of your test international career and certainly the, the start of your uh, state career, but I got the end of it and the end of it all. So there's a bit of memories here. Producer Sam's um, all over it as well. So uh, is this going to be an education for you or what's it going to be? Here? I was worried. I thought I was going to sit here and listen for a lot of it. And I already have the last half an hour that we've been listening to you before the <laughs> podcast started. So, um, no, but I genuinely think that I, like, I knew who you were from Who Dares Wins maybe before I knew you were a cricketer. Obviously, yeah. Dad probably gave me the education pretty quickly when I was like, this guy's really funny. <laughs> and then he started telling me some stories. But, um, yeah, it's quite a, it's, it's kind of cool to sit here and listen because cricket was very different back in the day. Very, very different. Yeah, it was a, another world back then. It and sounds I'm really like glad more I, fun. I, well, there was no social media. <laughs> Or phones with cameras in them back in my day. So we were a little freer. Um, and I think that was fun. Although, you know, my son says to me, what about the money now? And I go, oh, well, good luck to the boys. I mean, you know, right at the end of my career, we were getting enough money to sort of call yourself almost a professional if you were speaking and doing some coaching. But the millions on offer now. <laughs> I wouldn't mind coming back in a master's tournament over there, over 65s for a couple of hundred grand for six weeks. I'm happy. We'd all turn up. IPL seniors. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hads would be in the wheelchair. <laughs> I know for a fact that Hads would be missing if that was, uh, if that was the case, <laughs> permanently missing. But yeah, mate, it, it's an amazing life you've lived and it, it's obviously still really vibrant now because you're involved with uh, Randwick Petersham Cricket Club, which obviously just must keep you so attached to the game. You had the TV career, but we'll start with the cricket stuff and getting going. And it was, it was early on. You, you, you seem like a really robust character. So footy might've suited you, but you worked out early on where you grew up that I'll leave the footy to the guys that are really good. And I'll go down the cricket path because you, you grew up with some absolute superstars. Yeah, I did. I was very lucky growing up in Matraville that I played one season, I think when I was six for the Matto Tigers, but my dad worked out at Burrell Oil Refinery, which was halfway out to La Perouse. And he worked with this guy called Gordon Eller. And he happened to have like 11 kids, but a couple of them were Mark and Glenn Eller, Gary Eller, Rodney Eller, the older brother played for the Rabbitohs as well. And he said to my dad, oh, the boys are going to start playing footy next year. Why don't you bring Michael out there? And that lasted about eight years playing with the Ellers. Uh, Lloydie Walker as well played. He played rugby for Australia. Nathan Gibbs, who went on to captain the Rabbitohs in first grade, and he's become a very successful sports doctor. And he actually assisted in a couple of my knee operations with Merv Cross, which was really weird. 
just about to get knocked out, seeing a dude you played footy with saying, yeah, we'll see you after the operation. <laughs> but Nathan's been fantastic. And he's looking after the origin side now. He's looked after the Rabbitohs, Commonwealth Games, Olympics. So any thing, oh, my shoulder sore, I'll ring Gibbsy up. So that's a good, good relationship I've got with him. But playing out there at LARPA was fantastic. And what it did for me also was gave me a very close connection with the Indigenous community out there. And all them fellas are still my friends. And mm. I go out to LARPA a lot. I play Go, uh, golf at the Coast Golf Club and see a few of the boys going around there. They pick up all my balls and resell them back to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. And look, I didn't, I used to watch the Ella Brothers and Lloydie doing that stuff at eight, nine and 10. And I thought everybody could do that except me. But I worked out that they were just really, really special. And they changed rugby when they turned over to rugby and got involved with Ramwick and then New South Wales and then Australia. They changed how rugby was played. They invented sort of running rugby. And Mark Eller was the first guy that anybody ever saw kick across the ground mm. to awaiting David Campisi on the wing at Coogee Oval, straight into Campo's arms and bang. No one had ever done that. All the banana kicks. And I mean, Joey Johns was fantastic in inventing those kicks, but Mark Eller had done them all before Joey even thought about it. Yeah. So how'd you get, how'd you blend into cricket? Because by the early eighties, you're, you're playing for New South Wales, which... And you, then you go overseas and you're playing overseas so that the, the cricket becomes your, your life, basically. Yeah, I wanted to be a football player and I wanted mm. to play for the Rabbitohs. My family, my dad's family were all mascot East Lakes people and my sister and I would just, you know, dub red and green eye from day one. So they were my heroes. And when I was growing up in the 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, South played in five grand finals in a row and lost one of them in the middle, 1969 against Balmain. But in 1969, I was 10. Mm. So that was a really big time for me to be, to find heroes in sport. And all those South Sydney guys, particularly John Sattler, the captain in the front row, our toughest man of all time, he was my hero. And I found a hero in Dougie Walters in the cricket, but it was football and South. And I just played cricket in the summer mm. for fun and played it at school. Then a guy started ringing my place at seven and I was playing on the mats for Botany United and I'd bounced this older fella who was looking after the Marcellin Cricket Club mm -hmm. and his son was playing. And I didn't know that this guy had sort of played first grade and made hundreds for Ramwick. And he rang up the secretary and said, there's this maniac. <laughs> he's 17. He's got an afro and he's a left arm quick. And he bounced the crap out of me today <laughs> on the mats and he's got a bit of pace. So this guy, Lyle Gardner, started ringing mm. 16 Patterson Street, Matraville. I mean, you could look up the address in the phone book in those days. Whitney, 16 Patterson Street, Matraville, this is the phone. And what I was doing then was playing rugby league quite seriously and starting to have a few trials with the Rabbitohs and going down the beach in the summer in the morning, surfing with my mates and playing club cricket on the mats with my mates in shorts and the volley OCs in the afternoon. And this guy was inviting me down to have a game of fourth grade at yeah. Ramwick and I'd missed him about three or four more. I'd already gone down the beach and then this one day in October I just waxed me board up I'm just ready to go and my mother I heard the phone ring and my mum walked out the back door and said that was that Mr Gardner again the secretary <laughs> of Randwick Cricket Club and you'll go and play today at Snape I've already phoned Wayne this is another man my only bloke I knew had long whites and his mother will be waiting with the whites. Get on your bike and they're taking spikes to the ground for you. So dump the board. Like, and my father had just passed away a year before that. So I didn't want to give me mum a hard time. I said, oh, I'll go and play this fourth grade game. So I went and borrowed whites. And they turned up with half a dozen spikes and a pair really fitted me. And this was at Snape on the turf. And I took four for 16. And something changed in my head that day. Mm. It just... I went, wow, pulled a couple of bumpers, hit a bloke in the shoulder and I thought, wow, my pace is okay at fourth grade level. I can actually get going here and and something just changed. I still love my rugby league, but as I progressed then, I I decided to dive down the cricket rabbit hole mm. and it was the greatest thing I ever did. Absolutely. Did you ever have it's that? amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a surfboard wax ready to go out and then you, your life changed? For no, I was probably lying on the couch. <laughs> Mum or dad said, go outside and do something. Um, it's funny how you find the game, well, how yeah. you, f you fall in love with what becomes your life. 
And I don't know if you ever had that that moment where it clicks over. I mean, I had that moment early on when I worked out I wasn't good enough to be <laughs> professionally um, <laughs> adept at sport. So you, you you try and find a life Peach, talking did about. Did you have pressure to play boat? Because I played with your uncle. Yeah. Your dad played. Um, your other uncle played as well. Yeah. I mean, was there pressure or? No, I think because I was a girl. No, not really. I don't think it was. There was any expectation for me to play cricket. It was only really when. Well, we know back then girls couldn't play back then. We yeah. knew that. You know, how <laughs> well, wrong we no were. No. Oh, yeah. absolutely! It was bizarre. Yeah. No, I think it was just a. Nah, she she play every sport. Doesn't really matter what it is, and cricket didn't really have a pathway. And did you at the play time. everything? Yeah. Because I know you play good golf, and did you do like? Played netball, a lot of hockey, softball, hockey all netball, yeah, yeah. basically everything. Get all the girl school. sports. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get her out of school. Oh, yeah, no. I didn't want to go Another to school. Another note came home, yeah. year nine, she needs to miss this day because she's got to go yeah. after this carnival. I even <laughs> played lacrosse. I played lacrosse, lacrosse. for New South Wales oh. to get me out of a week of school. That looks like an incredibly bizarre potentially game. bizarre and violent Isn't game. It's awesome. one of the fastest ball sports I mean that, and it's like Canada, isn't it? Mainly is that. Yeah, know. America, but like when they fling it, yeah. I mean you fling it like super hard, don't you? Like it's yeah, yeah. it was good fun, good fun. Yeah, didn't just played one year of it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're catching it in that little net yeah, as the well, net. aren't yeah, you? Yeah, wow. it's amazing. Anyway, back to you. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, Do you, like you mentioned cricket was it was the greatest decision that you made? But do you think you could have gone on and played rugby, rugby league? Higher? My decision was helped by the fact that I was playing a trial for my last club mascot and I was playing inside centre. I ended up in the back row, which I love, second row and, and lock. And I passed this ball to the outside centre and I fell down a sprinkler hole. They hadn't put the cover on it. And I felt this <laughs> And it was the first operation. I'd done a cartilage in my right knee. In those days, it was... The big, there was no keyhole surgery in those days. So the doctor said, then you should give rugby league away. I don't think your knee's going to stand up to it. And you're playing cricket, aren't you? I think I was playing like third grade then and gone up a grade or two. And I wasn't really happy with that. So I, I kept playing for a little while and this knee just wasn't good. Every time I had major impact on it or something like that, get a bit of fluid on it, had the fluid pulled out. So I decided to get a bit more serious about my cricket. Little did that doctor know I had another nine knee operations <laughs> from playing cricket. And nine. Oh, I've just had my knees replaced. Two years tomorrow it is that I've had total bilateral knee replacement. So Merv Cross has basically built an empire. Sadly, yeah. Merv passed knees. away six months ago. Yeah. But when I used to run into him, I'd go, hey, Merv, how's my pool? <laughs> yeah. Your backyard. And he'd just laugh. So he did uh, seven of those nine, and then I've just had number 10 and 11 two years ago to for, replace them. For the listeners that don't know, Merv Cross is the like, doyen of knees, yeah, he was, basically. he was the legend of knee surgery. He was the first guy that brought um, keyhole surgery to Australia, yeah. and he was amazing. Incredible. Now, um, back to you, and okay, you, you progress along the way with Randwick, and yeah, like at St. Vincent's every Saturday afternoon, oh, here's another Whitney victim, he, he's hit him and got a broken <laughs> arm, this, that, and the other. You get to the New South Wales squad. Uh, and team, you make your debut, and it's against Queensland. So Greg Chapel, Alan Border, Jeff Thompson, some couple of great New South Welshmen in there, and a South Australian playing for Queensland. I just, <laughs> they were trying to buy the shield. <laughs> yeah. But Dougie Walters was still around. Yeah. Can you tell us the story, the great Dougie, who basically he was the great crossover from you know very social, old school way of doing things, but immensely talented, and he welcomes you in. How? To the setup. Well, he was my hero, as I said earlier, him and John Sattler. The first time I met John Sattler, I think I was in my late twenties mm -hmm. and I was shaking. I was that blown away about meeting him, but I'd played in some state trials to get in that year and played against Doug and knocked him over in a state trial at the University of New South Wales at, at the Village Green. And I could not believe going home that night that I've just knocked over my hero. Yeah. So... Oh, I couldn't even talk to him. I, I was struggling to look at him. I mean, this was my man. So I get picked in the first game, 17th of October, 1980 at the Gabba. And all those guys were playing. Kepler Vessels was playing and they had a great side. Martin Kent they had a really, really good side. Tomo, Carl Rackerman, um, Trevor Hons, I think, played as well yep. in that game. But yeah, we, Dougie took me out on night one. <laughs> so after play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we bowled first and, and we knocked them over. And, yeah. um, and uh, 
he took me out and he took me to the underground, which was a, a big nightclub there up in Brisbane. And he knew the dude on the door, so we got straight in. And he knew the manager, so we got a drink card. <laughs> And then another drink card. And I'm thinking, how good is this? I'm out with my hero. Anyway, we'd had a few beers. And I couldn't actually remember getting in the cab to go home, but I remember the taxi driver, like, patting me. And I woke up in the back of the cab, and we're back at the uh, oh, the motel, hotel motel. <laughs> Who was staying in in those days? And I go, uh, uh, uh. he said, I said, where's Doug? He said, no, Doug's gone. And he said, you'd pay the cab fare. <laughs> <laughs> Put in for the $2.20 or whatever it was. And I was struggling a bit the next morning and there he was having breakfast. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, the old dog, he's done this a thousand <laughs> times. Initiated the, you know, the young fella in the team and all this. So, I mean, I was, I'm humbled now that he did that for me. I mean, that's, you don't do, you can't do that anymore. You so that's just, leadership. He, that's, he was just checking you up to the mark. Oh, that's a standard, I reckon. I, yeah, I like well, it. I couldn't stay with him, Mitch, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. He loved it. In those days, he was smoking as well. Yeah. And just durry after durry and midi after midi <laughs> after midi. Unbelievable. He's my hero when I'm standing next to him. Cricket's changed just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It was much more fun back in the day. You didn't you didn't do something similar with yes. Mitch Litchfield when she, oh, no. <laughs> she got into the team? No, they're all, like, Mitch, they're all athletes day, now. Seriously, I think about it now. New South Wales is sponsored by Tui's and pretty much every <laughs> state had a, a beer sponsor. And the Australian cricket sponsor was Benson and Hedges. <laughs> So you weren't allowed to leave the dressing room until the two eskies were empty. And particularly with the Australian side, the Benson and Hedges dude would turn up every day with a bag and put 20 cartons of cigarettes. <laughs> like, think about that now. And half the team smoked in the dressing room. I mean, it's, I think about it now. It's bizarre. <laughs> you have to drink 10 beers and have half a cigar before you're allowed to get on the bus to go home. Unbelievable. And see, Dougie. Oh, you're more fun. Dougie loved that. Dougie loved all that. He yeah. loved the Siggy and, and stories and having a drink after the game. And we learn a lot of cricket yeah. like that, sitting with those old blokes in the dressing room for an hour or two after the game. Mm. Well, that is how you, that's how sometimes I struggle with the modern game in that regard, because I feel like that's, even when I was coming through, that's how I learned the most about the game mm. was sitting with the players that played um, in the generations before you. They'd teach you about life. They'd teach you about cricket, um, what to do when you're struggling, et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of, you miss that nowadays. Everyone's gets back to the change room. Everyone's on their phones, checking social media, whatever it might be. And everyone gets it, gets on the bus, goes back to their rooms and they do whatever they want. Right? Whereas you kind of, you miss all that in the modern day game. I think. It was so important to all of us young fellas. And if you made a mistake, I mean, Doug and Rick McCosker, Dutchie Holland, Len Pascoe, they weren't frightened to say, Hey, you're in the wrong spot down at Fine League, mate. I told you to be on the T in twoies and not the H. <laughs> and that cost us a boundary, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So pay attention. Mm. Like I need you there, not there. Mm. And I didn't mind getting a kick up the ginger from them blokes. I mean, I'd watched them all play uh, World Series cricket and they were my heroes. And here I was in the New South Wales team with some of them and just in awe. And they knew... I was playing cricket like I was a rugby league player and I got into a bit of trouble early saying to blokes, after the game, behind the stand and all this sort of stuff. You can swear, by the way, and Sammy can okay. beep it out. <laughs> I nearly did, Sam. Um, and I didn't think there was much wrong in that, but this is cricket. I yeah. mean, this was, the gentleman's game was still hanging around in those days. And the first person I asked out the back was Kepler Vessels at the SCG. <laughs> You're going to love this story. And he got 60 or 70 and... We'd had a few things, and I'm going, ah, you're South African, so and so, and go and play for your own country, and you come over here. So I finally get him out, and I give him the send off. And he's turned around and said, What did you say? I said, I'll see you after the game behind the stand. And as he's walking off, Steve Smalls run up to me and said, Oh, you don't know that he was South African Junior Golden Gloves boxing champion. <laughs> and I went, Oh. <laughs> so after the game, he's come in the dressing room. With this, where are you with this? <laughs> Two beers. I said, Chopper, sit right down there, mate. <laughs> you know, we never take it off the field. And the other one, believe it or not, was Justin Langer. In one of his first games at the Wacker, he walked out, you know, and we're yeah. all going, ah, you little gnome. And I've said to him, do you wrap your pads around your bat still? Like the under 12s are playing over there and he's barred up. And he got a few, he got 30 or 40. Give him a serve walking off. He's going, what do you say? I said, I'll see you after the game out there. <laughs> Then Jack Small ran up again and said, don't you know he's like a 10th Dan, <laughs> Kung Fu, Zendo Kai. He will take you down in two chops with her. So he walked in the dressing room. 
Jay Hill, come over here, mate. Sit down. <laughs> Hilarious, yeah. So good. Yeah, the two blokes I picked on would have smashed me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, talk us through your acceleration. It happened pretty quickly after state debut. It's not long before your test debut, 1981 test tour. You get called in because you're playing over there, having a great time playing, I'd imagine, county or league cricket in those parts. And all of a sudden, you're DK Lilly's roommate. What? <laughs> The great Dennis Lilly, the god, again, for new listeners, trying to get an appreciation of Dennis Lilly, what he was to Australia in the 70s and 80s. Think Sachin Tendulkar, think Rohit Sharma right now, combine them what India think of those Plus two. Plus Kohli. Plus Virat Kohli. <laughs> yeah. And you've got a, a fair idea of what Dennis Lilly meant to Australians back then, especially cricket lovers. Well, we grew up watching him all my era, and he was the greatest. I mean, he... He went away and perfected his action after some back problems. His training was something that bowlers had never done. He really upped the ante with flexibility. This P and F training that he was doing with some guys in Western Australia, and he come back. And when he come back after the back injury, whoa, it was the great DK in that fantastic run had complete control of what he was doing, and still had a bit of pace. So these were heroes, and. You were right, Adam. I played fourth grade, fourth grade, second grade, first grade. The second year of fourth grade, then second grade and first grade, we'd won premierships for Randwick. So I'd played in some important games already and then got in the New South Wales side, played three Shield games and a tour match against New Zealand and decided that I wanted to go to England play club cricket because a lot of boys were doing that. Mm. So I went to a club called Fleetwood. A couple of the Randwick boys had played there and turned up at Fleetwood with Peter Devlin, who... Ended up my first grade captain and the groundsman at North Sydney Oval for 30 years, Peter yeah. Devlin. Very good all-rounder. So he was the amateur and I was the pro. And there was a couple of New South Wales players scattered around England. And one of them was a guy from Newcastle called Greg Geese, a fine, fine player. And he was at Gloucestershire on an SA scholarship. This is where the story gets weird because I'm, I'm living with a 65-year-old woman and her 75-year-old husband. Edith and Eddie Funk. <laughs> now, when I turned up and he said his name in that Lancashire accent, <laughs> I, yeah, I went, he went, oh, it just clicked Edith and me. Eddie I was Funk. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Do they? And I'm, and I'm standing there and he was the ex mayor of Fleetwood and all this. He's a very esteemed gentleman. And I looked at him and I said, Can you spell that, please? And he went, F U N. N K. <laughs> so I live with the Funks. They were. <laughs> so I know it's just such a cool story, isn't it? And because I was only 22, mm. and all I wanted to do was party, play cricket first, party, mm. midge, and chase some English girls. Yeah, I don't want to know. Yeah, I know yeah. you don't want to know, but chase it, some cuddles. Yeah, it's fair. It's enough. 1981. The world was a different place. Yeah. And I'm oh. never home in the morning. And one day. <laughs> The phone rings and Edith said, can you pick it up? And you had to answer it like this. Hello, Fleetwood 2791. That's how you answered the phone in 1981. And this voice goes, Widow, Widow, is that you? I went, yeah. He goes, it's Geesey down at Gloucester. And the great South African all-rounder Mike Proctor mm. is injured. And they had another guy called Brian Brain, who was a seamer had taken like 1,500 first-class wickets. They're looking for a, someone to fill in. I said, right, give me your number. I'll get, ring, you back, ring you back. So I ring the chairman of Fleetwood and he says, well, you've got to play for us. But if you're available on Sunday or midweek, you can play first class cricket for them. So I go down, get on the train from Blackpool down to Bristol. It's like a boy's own annual story. <laughs> he, he picks me up and we, I have this trial with Gloucester and they sign me up. Uh -huh. So I start playing a few games for them. And I'd played a couple of first class games and some John Player 40 over one day games for them. And I bowled pretty well. Now, the Australians were there on tour 1981 and they'd watched a few of these games. And as their season was progressing, it's getting like a week before the fifth test and the news comes out that Lawson and Hogg are injured and are not up for the third spot at all. And they're talking about Carl Rackerman, who was at Surrey on an SA scholarship, and Mocker was injured as well. So I'm at Cheltenham for the cricket festival and I'm sitting on the balcony and we're playing Hampshire and Malcolm Marshall steaming in. I'm batting 11 
we're three for shit and everyone's padded up. <laughs> I'm padded up at 11. <laughs> we're only three down. Everybody's got their gear on because Malcolm's just <laughs> it's turbocharger. And then the guy comes out, the room attendant, Mr. Whitney, there's a phone call for you. Now it's th- three days, two days before the start of the test match, the fifth test. This could be a decider. So he hands me the phone and this voice goes, you've been picked for Australia. Good on you, mate. And I went, oh, I thought it was a mate of mine. I went, yeah, fuck off, mate. Like, <laughs> you're joking. Hung the phone up. Ten minutes later, it rang back. Yeah. And it was Fred Bennett, who was the manager of the Australian cricket team. I think he was chairman of New South Wales cricket. He ended up being chairman of Australian cricket. And Balmain president. Michael, it's Fred Bennett. You've been picked in the Australian team. <laughs> Leave now. You reckon I got them pads on? <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Steeman, get them on. And, and I drove up from Cheltenham to Manchester. I cannot remember one minute of that drive. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a total blank. But I pulled up at the Grand Hotel at Manchester and Fred said, come up to my room immediately. So I knock on the door and he opens. There's Fred Bennett and there's Kim Hughes, who I'd only met briefly mm. during the last season. And I went, oh, oh. I mean, I'm not going to say Mr. Hughes. He said, call me Kim. I think I went, call me Wit, which is a little crazy at that stage. But he said, you're playing tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> Straight in. Far out. What I'm doing now, I was doing to them too. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I said, you're joking, aren't you? He went, no, you're going to bowl first change after Terry Alderman and Dennis Lilly opened the bowling. Wow. <sighs> I'm in shock. And then Fred... God love him because you get your cap presented on the ground now. He's in a couple of cardboard boxes into the manager's room and he throws a jumper over. There's your jumper. (laughs) There's your baggy green. (laughs) None of this presented on the. So I've got all this gear and they said, go up to your room and then come down at 6.30. We're going to have a press conference to announce that you're in the 11 tomorrow. Hmm. So I go up to the room with my gear and there's already someone there and I go, oh, wow, who am I rooming with? Like... And I looked at this beautifully crafted leather port in the corner and it's got DK Lily like embossed in the top. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> then he came, he walked in the door 10 minutes later. And I remember I stood at attention. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Oh, oh, oh. And he, mate, he was so. Did you do one of them? Yeah. I, I felt like I did not salute yeah. 100% Mitch, like go down on one knee and yeah. drop in front of God because yeah. he was God. He was the greatest fast bowler, still is in the top handful ever. But at that time, he was fantastic to me. Mm. He was just so cool. I went down and did this interview, tried to sleep that night. <sighs> Man, I'm playing the next the next day. I'm at the ground. I'm in the 11. Okay. So we turn up. Well, this is another great story. Whatever he did the next morning, I did. If he went and had a crap, I was straight in after him. <laughs> Clean the teeth. I thought if it's, if that's his preparation and he's the great DK, I'm good. We go down and no one's in the breakfast room at the hotel. I go, what, what are we early? No, we're late. Oh. He said, they're gone in the bus. I thought he was bullshitting, but they'd gone. I hadn't even heard the time, what the yeah. bus was leaving. I was just floating around in this <laughs> tripping cloud of amazement. Yeah. He said, have some breakfast. I've got a mate that'll take us. So we, we let, this is my first day. Yeah. I land like 20 minutes late. And then I try to get in the pavilion while Dennis is talking to the bloke in the car park. And the bloke goes, hey, hang on, who are you? <laughs> I said, oh, I'm, I'm Mike Whitney. Who? <laughs> I'm actually playing today, mate. He said, I've seen a couple try to get into the pavilion, but that's a bloody good story. He had to ring up. And they said, yeah, Mike Whitney's playing today. <laughs> then I walked into the pavilion. I ran into Jeff Boycott, yeah. who I'd met briefly at, little, at, at Fleetwood because he was having a testimonial year. Hello, Mr. Whitney. I said, oh, Jeff. Oh. He said, good good look, not too much, mate. He walked down the stairs. And then I walked in the dressing room and I'm 20 minutes late. And Kim just gives me the finger. I said, oh. <laughs> he said, look, you may or may not think you're special, but he does this to every debutante. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I felt very relieved yeah. then. I just joined the long line of debutantes that DK's held back for half an hour on day one. Thank God for that. And we bowled. Yeah. We bowled. And you've got a couple of wickets. <sighs> Man. David Gower, your first one. Yeah. 
had him dropped at first slip by Graham Wood, the over before, mm. went through Basil's hands, hit him in the mouth, <laughs> and he went off. It's like me first, well, do you want to hear about the first over? <laughs> Lily and Autumn and open the bowling, and finally I get the shoulder from Kim. So this is probably the start of the second hour. And it's, I could have grabbed the clouds. This is a Manchester <laughs> yeah, day. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. And it's overcast and it's full of English people and a lot of people from Fleetwood, hmm. God bless them, came down to watch that day. Oh, that's nice. So they experienced that day yeah. with me that's and right. they all say, well, we were barracking for you. We're, oh, but we want a bloody England to win. <laughs> so it was crazy. Anyway, I finally get the nod and here it is and I'm bowling to... um. Oh, we opened the batting. It was very slow. He got the slowest 50. Tavaray. Yeah, Chris Tavaray. That 60 or whatever he got in the first innings was the slowest half century in English Test cricket history. And in county cricket, he actually played a few shots anyway. Bowling to Tav, and he just sort of squeezed it to square leg, and we had someone there next to the umpire at square leg. No run. <sighs> yeah. First one's out. It's a dot ball. It's on the square. You know, the boys are, yeah, hey, good on you, winner. And there was a few New South Wales guys in that squad, which is great. So as I'm walking back, shining the ball, I feel this spit, 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 spit. And it starts raining. Mm. And it rains heavy enough that we go off after one delivery <laughs> for an hour. Oh, dear. So by the time I finish that first over, I've never checked this up. It has to be the longest debut over <laughs> in Test cricket history. It went for like an hour and five minutes or 58 <laughs> minutes or whatever it was. It went for an hour. Yeah. And in that first over, I get a nick off David Gower and it hits Basil in the, in the um, mouth and they carry him off. <laughs> this is all in my first over. <laughs> so third over, I think David Gower's had another swipe at me and it's gone to Graham Yallop in the gully. And, and David Gower was a very, very good player, mate, mm. like... A lot of Mark War-ish, very look nonchalant, but just timing and beautiful hands. Yeah, I was pretty happy <laughs> having him as my first scalp, let me tell you. Imagine. Amazing. Um, it was just, look, it was just an unbelievable experience just mm. to be with the Australian team. And, and England, you know, they beat us. And that was, when it was all said and done, that was Botham's ashes. Yeah. That was the one that he won when they, at one stage in a game they were five hundred to one. Yeah, yeah. That was Edge Baston um, and uh, and Leeds Headingley. He did just ridiculous things. He got a hundred in that Test match. I knocked him over when he scored a hundred. You sent him off? No. <laughs> but he, I won't see you in the car park. After. But he did say to me, "You know, you're the only baller I didn't hit for six in that game." <laughs> Beautiful. That was because he got DK a couple of huge hook shots with no helmet on, and I was down at fine leg, and I thought it had hit him. Next minute, they yell out, catch it! And I'm on the fence, and this thing just sailed over the boundary, and the second one went over the stand into the railway yard behind. Yeah. Just amazing. And they weren't big bats in those days, but Beefy was a very big, strong man. So amazing. It was an amazing experience. It changed my life. I bet. I bet it's um it, as we said at the start. This is story time with yeah. we're, we're we're skipping over things that we really we're only at, but we, we're only at question yeah. three. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. But it, this then gets you a bit of notoriety, especially back here in Australia. Yeah, colourful character, like guy that obviously is just spilling everything to play for Australia. Yeah, Australians love that. So you get back and you get the call from Tui's to say, "Hey, you want to yeah. be his dad?" Now, <laughs> this is the educational process for Midge as well during this because I showed her the ad again. I'm sure you've seen it again. I had a look at it last night. It's just a classic piece of Australian <laughs> Australiana, I'd call it. You're going out there, and the, the the setting is that you've got to win a game for New South Wales against a touring West Indies side. Yeah. <laughs> Artistic license has been taken in this ad <laughs> because you're coming out to face Joel Garner without a helmet on. Although I will say the hair. Probably would have caught the ball anyway. <laughs> Take us through the filming of that. You've got a few guys, a few local guys that um, from your area on the hill as extras who really enjoyed the experience. There's one guy that ends up with a two his carton on his head, but it was just a, a great ad that still, still you look back now and go, wow, that's. Um, I that's should remake it. Yeah, it should. remake it with the current crew. <laughs> Wonder who would fill the role of Michael Whitney. <gasps> Excuse me. Well, there's not a lot of hair like that going around nowadays, so. No. Well, Pat Cummins has got to be in there. 
Yeah, Pat- they're all mullets yeah. now. Short on the side, mullet at the back. I'm just. I, th- I think they'd have to put Nathan Lyon in there as the, the <laughs> protagonist, and maybe Lyon. I'll be on the hill with the carton on my head. <laughs> <laughs> but mate, what an ad! It all well, as I, I said a little bit earlier, Tui's were our major sponsor, hmm. and the fact that there'd been a lot of press about me debuting, and I played in the last test as well, the sixth test at the Oval, which was a draw, which was amazing. And Dirk Wellham made his debut in that test and made 100 on debut. So there was a lot of talk about us two young New South Wales cricketers when we got back. And Tui's decided they'd made an ad with Stumper Rickson and DK Lilly, where Stumper sort of hooked DK for a six. That was the first Tui's ad. And they decided to make one around the Blues. And for some reason, they they decided not to use Dirk. But Steve Rickson was working for Tui's in their promotion and promotional marketing sort of side. Mm. So it was me and Stumper again. So we play South Australia in Adelaide and West, uh, West Indies are playing them a week later. So they decide we'll make the first half of the ad down there at Football Park in Adelaide. <laughs> this is an AFL ground with no square on it, <laughs> no semblance of a rolled area. So we turn up and they're already saying, we just can't get them up to square. How's he, <laughs> how's he gonna drive Joel for, for three or four, you know? Um, <laughs> and the guy, the guy that came in, if you watch the ad, there's a guy that nicks one yeah. into the slips for me to come in. Joel's trying to look after him on this part rolled AFL field and it's digging in and there's divots coming out and they're trying to get it right. They can't get it right. So they bring in a metal plate about as long as this table and three times as wide and whack that in front of him and say, Joel, bowl a couple on that. Well, of course. <laughs> They're starting to take off. And if you watch that guy get a slight, oh, he actually, it's a good one. Catches in the slips. He's out. I come in. We need three to win off one ball. So they take this metal plate away, and John's trying to pitch pitch it up. He's really trying to look after me. After about 90 minutes, he goes, Where does my arm is two meters long now. <laughs> it's hanging down, down me and her ankles have bowled the longest spell and you can't hit it. I go, man, Big Bird, I'm trying, man. <laughs> Vib's going, with us, hit the ball up the square and all this. And eventually Joel says to the whole whole sort of production crew and the executive producing that, look, this, he went, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and you're looking at six foot nine, he's a big boy, Joel. He said, I'm going to stand behind Wits and I'm going to throw it out to the boundary. And when I think the time's right, I'm going to say, no, and you just play the shot. Yeah. So we did that a couple of times and it worked. <laughs> so I'm now going to come level with you guys and tell you, I never hit that ball <laughs> that ran out to the boundary that Viv fielded. Joel threw it out there and I swung, swung the bat right at the right time. And it looked like I hit it. I did. I'm sorry to everybody that's watched that ad <laughs> since 1981, but I never hit it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we finished that film and they go, SCG, three weeks later, we'll do the end bit of the footage. Yep. If you look at the start of the ad, I've got the big <laughs> afro. If you look at me running off at the end, it's really trimmed up because without thinking halfway through that three week break or whatever it was, I went and got a haircut. Well, you needed one. I did need yeah. one, but when I turned up, the makeup and hair ladies. Freak. Oh, and they've got that comb, you know, that afro comb, and they're trying to afro it out, but I'd had it cut too short. Uh. And people started to realise, oh, we got a haircut halfway <laughs> through the ad, and it became a trivia question and everything, but. What that did was I thought my profile from playing those two tests was like reasonably big. Yeah. Oh, no. It just shot into yeah, yeah. the world, the universe, to the point where I'd be out with a few of my mates and people would go like this. Oh, you're the actor on that too, is that? <laughs> <laughs> the actor. That's as how much saturation that had. Yeah. And all my mates are going, oh, no, he bloody plays cricket. Oh, does he? <laughs> because not everybody follows the cricket and there was no social media. There was no laptop computer. It was only TV then and radio. Mm. But I was the actor on the ad. That's how much impact that thing had on my life. And it, they said they were going to run it for a year. It went for about six years and other ads came on the back of that. Mark Richards did a surfing one. Mark Ella did a rugby one. There was a truckload. That, Manly Para, was that a Yeah, that was yeah. another one. Yeah, Manly Parramatta Manly game, Pira. yeah. And yeah. now that they're, they're still, I mean, they're 
they're ever present now because they're on well, YouTube. Well, they brought so. back, <laughs> I feel like, a Tui's yeah, yeah. on the TV, which was the original song that was written for those ads 40 years ago, my day. How good. Yeah, How good. crazy. And it was the Mojo crew who did come Mojo, on. Mojo, very, very come good. On, I did a few on. campaigns with the Mojo and they were great, yeah. Uh, we're going to take a little spell here. Wit. Breathe more, in. More stories to come. Uh, stories about Rod Marsh, about getting out Lara, Tendulka, and TV, his TV career. Mike Whitney, back in a sec. We're back with Mike Whitney. Uh, we've got some things to get through here about some of the great batsmen you um, got rid of on the international stage. But I'm going to pick it up with an incident in a Shield final against a man that you no doubt respected at the time, but you were a competitor. He was very much a competitor, Rod Marsh, the deal he departed. And I'm, I'm guessing this incident has a, a happy twist at the end because you didn't talk for a while after it. Yeah. But you're glad you made your peace. Yeah. Now that he's obviously, sadly, and too soon passed yeah. on. But what happened with Rod Marsh in a Shield final at the Wacker? I realised when I got in the New South Wales team that it was pretty competitive with all states, but... Even then, there were two states that it was like more competitive with. And Western Australia were the leading state at the time and had won the Sheffield Shield a number of times over the last six or seven seasons. And half their side was in the test, test side mm. at the time. The test openers were, you know, um, Bruce Laird and uh, Graham Wood, um, Kim Hughes, um, mate, a lot of people, DK, Terry Alderman, um, Rodney, Keeping. So they were, they were a four. So... Yeah, our guys weren't real fond of them and loved playing them. And the other side was Queensland. I mean, there was a, there was a level of competition against Queensland, which oh, was, we weren't too fond of each other. Yeah. <laughs> After the game in the sheds, not too bad, but out on the field, it was, on. It was quite vicious sometimes. Anyway, we get to... 82-3, this is my third season. I'd played those couple of tests after my first year and New South Wales were doing pretty good under Rick McCosker and we'd got a few young players in me, Greg Matthews, Murray Bennett. So this new sort of young and very competitive group of players were coming through. So we make the first Shield final and it's in Western Australia. They were on top of the competition at the time and these were the rules. Whoever was first, not first past the post anymore, you host a five-day game. So this was the five, first five-day domestic game ever played in the world. Mm. It's a Shield final. We went over there pretty buoyant, but it, we hadn't really worked out how to play on Perth yet. I mean, I was still bowling a bit short because it's flying through and, and mm. the SCG was a turner. Mm. So to run in and bowl somewhere where you saw it carry and you could hear it slapping into Steve Rickson's gloves was just a turn on <laughs> for me and me and the other bowlers. But Henry, he already knew and he'd really been in my ear about trying to pitch it up a little bit more in Perth. Anyway, we get to Perth. Jeff Lawson captain then. Uh, no, Rick McCoskey oh, was Rick captain. Was, yeah, Rick. yeah. Rick Rick was just wonderful. Yep. Oh, just a legend. You know, I just love that man so much. He taught us so much. He could have yelled and swore at us, but I've never heard him raise his voice or swear once ever mm. in my life with Rick McCoskey. That's the sort of bloke he is. Anyway, uh, we're into the game, and I remember Jeff Marsh, I think, was batting five or six then. And he was getting a few runs, and Rodney was in, and they were starting to get a few runs. And Rick come up to me and said, mate, I need you to bowl another spell. I went, mate, I'm on. No dramas. Because we'd, they'd made Len Pascoe 12th man. Len wasn't very happy. I <laughs> wouldn't imagine Len. He wouldn't have told anybody either. <laughs> <laughs> Midge, I can't remember Len coming out with the drinks or a jumper or a cap once during that game. Oh, he wasn't happy. And look, pretty much deservedly. So he still had a pretty good year that year and taken yeah. some wickets. But he wasn't happy. Anyway, I come on to bowl the spell and I'm bowling to Rodney. And Rodney's a very competitive man, and I had utmost respect for him being the Australian vice captain and an unbelievable wicket keeper. He might have been the world record holder then at that stage. I can't remember. But I bounced him and he hooked me. Mm. And then a couple of balls later, I thought, oh, I'm going to run in and do the Andy Roberts. I'm going to put two yards extra into this one if I can. And we had Steve Smith, the original Steve Smith, <laughs> yeah. Stephen Barry Smith. What a player he was. So I've run in and gone, bang, and it's Got big on Rodney, he's seen it, and he's gone to hook it, got a top edge, and it's gone out to Stephen Barry Smith, Stan Smith, and he's out. And it was a really big wicket for us. It was a big wicket. We needed a wicket. And to take him down as the vice captain of Western Australia, Kim was the captain, and as he's walking off, I yelled out, F off, really loudly. He walked about... 15 or 20 metres 
and it just got the better of him. And he turned around and said, what did you say? So I said, you effing heard me, F off. And he kept coming with the bat. So I just charged him and I'm ready. I'm ready to drop him on the ground. This is the old mascot rugby league, South <laughs> Sydney rugby league player. So there's a photo of us and I'm just into him. By that stage, Rick McCosker's grabbed me and Peter too. He's got him and they pull us apart. So he gets to the end of the game and I go into their dressing room. They batted pretty much most of the day and that's the process, the bowling. No, we'd, no, no, we'd knocked him over. We're batting. So we go into the bowling room at the end of the day. And I thought I better apologise to him. He's a vice captain of Australia. I might not get another game. So I walked over and said, Rodney, I'm real. And he cut me off there. He said, who do you think you are? Can't fucking bowl. Big mouth. So I've actually pulled the left fist back. I'm going to drop him in the dressing room now. It's crazy when I think about this and the way I thought back then. And our manager, um, I'd have to think of his name, saw it, grabbed me. Dragged me out of the dressing room, put me in our dressing room, and locked me in there. Locked the door <laughs> from the outside. So I'm in there. Ah, I'm really pumped up. I'm ready to go. Yeah. And the whole rest of the team walks in, and Rick goes, "Settle down." Ah, <laughs> I said, "I saw." He said, "I, you know, what were you going to do?" I was going to drop him on the spot. I went to apologise. He said, "Settle down." He's doing this. To you. Mm. So I'll leave it there. I'll pick it up in the dressing room the next morning. Oh, there was electricity in the dressing room the next morning. There was this, there was electricity coming out of people's fingers the next morning. It had just, it was on (laughs) for young and old now. That, what I'd done on that field and what happened in the dressing room, even the quiet boys in the team were walking around going, <laughs> mate, I'm telling you, turn into state of origin, yeah. mate. It was on Fiona. It was one of the greatest games of cricket I've ever played. It was a low scoring game. It was like two sixty to two fifty to mm. two forty to two forty something like that, and it went to the last session of the last day. And they needed about forty to win or something like that. But walking off at T, Kim Hughes grabbed Rick, and he said, "Is it gone now? You're gonna lose." Because Kim was in and he's hit the ball really well. Rick just shut our door and said, did you hear what he said to us then? Did you hear what he said to me Mm. and us that we're gone? Well, the electricity started. The bolts just came out of everybody's fingers again. And I took the last catch off Trevor Chappell Mm. to win the game. Now, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you now. I take this catch off Wayne Clark, their bowler. Great, great bowling. Take the catch. We've won the match. Away from home. We hadn't won in Perth for 17 years. We hadn't won the Shield for 20. And I've gone, yeah. And we've all run in and jumped around. So where's the ball? That piece of cricket memorabilia <laughs> that I should have held on to. Well, some kid's playing down a lane with it in Perth now. <laughs> I threw that ball away. No one even, because we got in the dressing room and Rick goes, where's the ball, widow? Well, I went, I shot it up in the air. So we lost the ball that we won the first shield final with because I was so excited. But that was the start of a 10 to 15 year New South Wales regime that just took everyone down. (laughs) (laughs) But with Rod, it turned into a bit of an ice age between you and him. Years went by. Yeah. If he saw me, he just walked the other way and I wasn't going to engage him because if he had said something still. What broke it then? We're at a luncheon, we're sitting at a table mm. and I'm looking at the table and I'm like three spots away is Rod Mars. Oh, I didn't yeah. say it or anything. They've just put that in DK's sitting there. And Dennis went, have you girls kissed and made up yet? <laughs> Imbeciles, you know? And I went, oh, I was a bit over the top. He said, I thought you were going to knock me out on the ground. Oh. I said, oh, don't, Rod, because it was years later yeah. and you're a bit more mature. So we... Kissed and made up, and Good. I went down to Adelaide and coached at the, he's uh you know the centre down there. We had all the young players, and and we were pretty good mates after that. But uh, when I think about it now, oh, it was just such a ridiculous thing to do on the field to the Australian vice captain. This bloke had enormous respect. 
but we were just so committed to that game. Would you rate it if a youngster started getting into you? Um, Playing state stuff? Yeah, a little bit. Days? It happens. Yeah. And there's a part of me that, like, I'd be standing there like Rod and go, who the hell are you? But yeah. then at the same time, it, like, I'm like, take some big balls to stand there and do that and then back it up, more importantly. Yeah. In the dressing room. <laughs> well, more well, so on the field, later, which seems like you did. We knew you were up for it yeah. after that. And what they meant by that was just give me the ball. Yeah. I'm, I'm up for the game. Yeah. No matter who I'm playing for, where I'm playing, just give me the ball. I'm I'm here to do my job and I'm up for the game. And I mm. prided myself on that. Well, that's where you learn pretty quickly who you do that to and who you don't do that to. <laughs> I mean, I think they learn pretty quickly, like, let's not fire that bloke up because he'll actually back it up and yeah. he'll bowl and bowl it's and bowl. It's funny, the next couple of seasons, very little was said to yeah. me on the field <laughs> by people who had had a chip, oh, you are, and whatever. Yeah. 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 The word must have got round real well, quick. Uh, the, the who do you think you are, then the person saying that, Knows exactly who you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly for the rest right. of time. <laughs> yeah. So it, it sticks in their mind, and you yeah. get a reputation. Yeah. But you, your international career, I mean, you, you had those knee injuries, and at one point it was like mm, this could be dicey. But it, actually, you got it fixed, and you you went on. Um, test career, uh, one day career. Did you get enough out of it? Do you feel in terms of wickets? No. Uh, no. What, what you're able to achieve? No, I wanted to play. I played a dozen tests. I wanted to play 50. Mm. I played, I think, 38 or 39 one day. I wanted to play 100. But you're only in control of so much in your career, and you're definitely not in control of selection. Mm. Um, I think my style of play and even the way that I conducted my cricket, a bit like Mo, but not out as far as left field as Greg Matthews, a lot of people looked at it and thought, this is really unconventional, like the Afro... Look, I, I had tattoos, a couple of tattoos when I was 18 and it started circling around the first class arena that I was the only first class cricketer with tattoos. So I had a little rose on my bum <laughs> and a little swallow on my shoulder and some of the opposition would come in, oh, give us a look at these tattoos. I mean, it was just such a weird thing back then and it was still the gentleman's game and there was Mo playing his guitar and, <laughs> and me sort of coming from rugby league and, and the beach mm. and it was uncomfortable for some of the older people because this wasn't the traditional route to play cricket. And I had played no representative cricket at all. I'd never played under 17s and I'd never played anything like that. And all of a sudden, woof, here's this maniac playing for New South Wales. And now he's played two tests hmm. and he hasn't even had the pathways thing like what's going on. So it took a little time for a few people around the country to to sort of get what Mo and I were trying to do. And not that we were doing it on purpose, but people like Mo moved the game forward a lot as far as looking at the traditions of it and going, that's really old fashioned. Let's try and make it a bit of more of a modern game. And I suppose subconsciously, without even knowing, that's what we were trying to do. But, that's, but Mo gets around now and he's in his blazer. <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of like a retrograde. Anyway, but um, some, of the, some of the guys that you did uh, dismissed from international cricket. I mean, there, like, it's a pretty good list. That uh, Lara, at one point, I won't call him your bunny, yeah, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> because he's probably coming out for Triple M in the summer. Yeah. I might get back and I might be banned, but I'm not sure. Um, Tendulkar, these guys, uh, even I remember it clearly. And Midge, this was a famous day for Australian cricket because this is when the Australian Test team sucked. It wasn't very good. It was going through the doldrums mid '80s. Alan Border comes in. And this bloke over here, batting average six in his test career, decides to face the great Richard Hadley who could swing it around corners. 18 balls, sees him out, felt like a victory. So those moments, what, what, what grabs you when you think back, okay, I had that test career and this was bloody enjoyable. Look, the dozen tests I played, something happened in every single one of them. Those first two ended up both in Zashes, just amazing. The next one was blocking out Hadley at the MCG. And that was really significant because Alan had been captain for two years at that stage and hadn't won a series as a captain. Mm. And we were one nil up in that three test series. So it was, I think we won in Brisbane, maybe a draw in Sydney. And then this was the Boxing Day test in Melbourne. And we were going to win easy. In fact, my mum and sister were there and they went home early because we were going to win easy on the last early day. Crow. And then they get home and I blocked him out. And my mum went, what happened? You know, we left home early. So 
I remember walking out, Richard Hadley, they took the second new ball. I mean, what a bowler. He'd taken five in the first innings and he'd just taken five in the second innings. So he's got 10 for, and we needed 35 or something off five overs. And it's me and Billy McDermott. Mm. <laughs> so I go out to Billy and I go, look, Billy, just, we're not going to get, we can get him. We can get him. Well, I thought, you might be going to yeah. get him. I won't, I won't be getting any of mine. And like, <laughs> let's just try and see it out. So. We blocked and blocked and got a couple. I think I got two or three. Billy got a couple of edges. And in the second last over in particular, Danny Morrison's bowling and there was a couple of really close LBWs. I mean, Ian Smith says he still has nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and i got to tell you about one of them, right? Craig goes back and across and he's pretty adjacent and it hits him about halfway up the leg. <laughs> and I'm walking down and I go... You know when you're at the yeah. strikers and you sort of go, fuck, that's close, man. That is really close. And Dick French, the New South Dick Wales French. umpire, yeah. is umpiring in Melbourne for this game. So I turn around to walk back and I'm looking at Dick and his eyes just flashed towards me and he went, not out. <laughs> I, in my head I went, Dicky boy, that's my man. Now I still see Dick around at some functions and I go, Dick, 87 Melbourne. He goes, oh, the LBW, uh, still not out with that. <laughs> That's my man. Kiwis must have lost their shit, oh, though. Yeah. Mate, Danny Morrison was that close. He was on the wicket, pounding the wicket, <laughs> and Dick's just gone not out. Oh, man. Ian Smith still talks about it. There was two LBWs in that last game. <laughs> that one was very, it was going underneath, I think. That's the only way it was going to miss. Anyway, it gets down to the last over, and I'm at the striker's end. And I look up the end and Billy McDermott's got the gloves off and he's sitting on the bat. So he's not running. <laughs> <laughs> I've either got to block it out or whatever. And, you know, to Richard's credit, mate, it was his 30 something over in the second innings. Wow. He's still doing the business with it. He'd completely revolutionized fast bowling. He'd, he'd played that much in England. He'd cut his run up down to this really economical, perfect action. Just everything. I talked to him about it now. We became really good friends after that. And he says, and he's really honest, it's one of the worst moments in my cricket career. Mm. I've been on stage when he said that. And I said to him the first time he said it, are you feeding? He goes, mate, I'd just taken 400 test wickets <laughs> and I had to bowl out you yeah, or Craig McDermott <laughs> with the second new rock. Like, you reckon I'm fucking disappointed or what? <laughs> I, 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 oh, yeah. Anyway, I sort of hung in there and, and blocked out the last over. And again, Adam, I've got to tell you, mate, I didn't realise the impact that that was going to have on my life and my career. Mm. It just shot me into stellar universe again because I hadn't been sort of on the international scene for a fair few yeah. years and had a few injuries and coming back from the knees. That was amazing. So I said to him in the dressing room that night, hey, Rich. He go, yeah, wit. I said, every time I see you, mate, I'm just going to wave. I'm still doing it now. <laughs> like, he's 60 something, nearly 70. I'm 65. Rich! Yeah. He goes, oh, Do you at least say, again. sir? Sir Richard. Oh, yes. yeah. Sir. Yeah, sir. <laughs> well, this is the best story out of that. And it's a long story, so I'll try and keep it tight. Walking off the ground, Ian Smith hands me the ball and he says, you you deserve that, Whitty. You did a great thing for Australian cricket today. Because it's now Alan Border's first win as a test captain. Yeah. And we really moved on from that point. And Richard instantly puts his arm around me and he says, mate, you did a great thing for Australian cricket today. So I've got the ball, right? It's the ball he took a five for with. Oh. So years go by and like 10 or 15 years ago, when did I give it back to him? Yesterday. 2015. So it's nine years ago. Hmm. So I had it for like 28 years <laughs> and I'd been at a couple of functions with him. And he goes, oh, that ball. I went, yeah. Have you still got it? I said, I've still got everything, mate. I've kept everything. Hmm. He said, well, out of the 36 Fifers that I took, it's the only one I don't have. Oh. So I used to say to him, Ian Smith gave it to me. Fucking bad luck. <laughs> so the 2015 World Cup where Starkey knocked over what's he in the final with that unbelievable in-swinger. Baz, yep. Two nights before that, they had a really big function down there and all of the greats were there. Viv was there. Sir Ian Bowden there? was there. No, I wasn't there, but I remember it yeah. being Everybody on. Everybody yeah. was there. And they called me and said, because they knew this story about the ball, Hadley's going to be there. Do you want to, and I plan to give him the ball back. Do you want to give him the ball back? We'll get you up unannounced. Mm. So halfway through the night, Mark Nicholas goes, hey, Mike Whitney's here somewhere. We don't know what he's doing here, but he's coming up on stage. So I told this story in a very reduced thing, got Richard up, had the ball in my pocket. 
Yeah. And I handed it to him on stage and I said, this is my ball, Richard, <laughs> but I'm giving it to you on permanent loan forever. This is the one that you're missing, the 36th mm. Pfeiffer in your career. Or he grabbed it and he put it in his fingers for that outswinger. And then this tear oh, wow. ran down the side of his face. And he looked at me, mate. He was, yeah. this is a cricket ball. That's all it is. But the power that cricket has and, and this piece of memorabilia. So we did all these interviews after that gig with some press that was there. Then I started getting emails and letters from people in New Zealand, politicians, saying what you've done for trans-Tasman sport with Sir Richard Hadley, unbelievable. It's a cricket ball. Mm. Five and a half ounces of cork and leather. But the power in this thing. So... A couple of years go by and I'm doing another gig at the SCG. It was, I can't remember, but Richard's a guest speaker. And Lady Diana, his wife's there. Mm. So he goes up and I go, Diana, how's my ball going? She said, as soon as you open the front door, it's in a case <laughs> with the story in the front door. So it's a cricket ball. Yeah. But to Richard and to Sir Richard Hadley and myself, it's connected us for life the fact that i gave it back to him mate he i can't express the emotion that he was going through on that mm. stage he had a tear that ran down his face and straight for the outswinger <laughs> he, he grabbed, put it yeah, in yeah. and just <laughs> cocked it <laughs> that outswinger it was it's one of the best things i've ever done in my life to give that back to him it meant so much to him so question then uh, back to the original where that started if you if you had your time again, would you rather play 100 boring tests or the 12 exciting ones that you did? 100 boring tests. Oh, okay. I'll limit that 60 boring tests or the 12 that you did. Because I feel like you've got a story and you mentioned it yourself that you, something amazing happened in every one of those. Yeah. So would you take that over 50 boring ones? Tough one. Oh, Midge, I just wanted to play more test cricket. Fair enough. I just would have played and played and played and played. So the ones that I got selected for, I really dug into them yeah. and absorbed everything that was happening in them because I was always on the fringe of selection yeah. and waiting for Bruce Reed to be injured or Merv's pulled a hammy or something like that. And I was always the next one in and I really wanted to be not the next one in the first one selected, the one. but these guys were great bowlers. And look, I'm not going to say the selectors had their favourites, but definitely Simo liked that Billy, Merv, Bruce Reed. And I've got to say about Bruce Reed, being a left armour, you know, we're different to everybody else, but Bruce was just, mate, when he was on, unplayable. What was he, six foot eight? Yeah, Something tall, like tall man, no hair, hairless. <laughs> So I'm, yeah, okay. I've got to uh, tell you this story. Uh -oh. We played a one day. No, no, we played it. Well, this will image, create an image in here. We played a one day at, at the Wacker, yeah. and we're going to win easy. And there was Billy, Merv, Bruce Reed, and myself. We all played in the game. Yeah. So I'm going down to get in the shower early. And as I walk past the door of the shower, there's two in the shower. And I look, there's Merv in the shower, the hairiest man of all time, <laughs> and 130 kg, and standing next to him is the most hairless person <laughs> with blonde hair, six foot nine, and like a pencil. Yeah, 71 kilos. And I'm looking down there, and Merv goes, what are you looking at? I go, if I could take a photo of that, <laughs> but it's going to be burned into my psyche yeah. for the rest of my life. And, you know, Merv, oh. <laughs> but Bruce Reed, because of his height, when I swung the ball, I swung it from sort of here. Mm. But Bruce would come down and swoop it in. Mm. And from that height, it would, it's like Starkey. He bowls that swooping one in because he's high. Yeah. But Bruce had a much higher arm action than Mitchell. And he would let this thing go and you'd see it track down and it'd go, <sighs> and they just couldn't play it. Mm -hmm. Where my, my plane was a very different plane to him and they could see me a lot better because I was only six foot one. But he was bouncy, pacey, but too tin. And his back and his shoulder, oh, and man. he had so many it's injuries. Oh, just not yeah. built for the rigors. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you, so your international career, early 90s, you're playing a lot of one-dayers. You end up with 30-odd one-dayers as well. Um, 
skip forward here and you go, for your last international wicket, it's listed here by producer Sam. Brian Lara. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> My last two test wickets are last two Lara, test. Lara Lara. Lara Lara. Really? Yeah. What'd you have over him? Uh, I went to the went to the West Indies in 91 and he didn't play a game, but he was 12th man for all the test matches and he was captain. Did you uh, enjoy those tours by the, by the way in the Windies? In the Caribbean. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, the, to two of the West Indies. It was the last long tour to the West Indies. It was five test matches and we played a number of tour matches as well. And they're just such a cool race of people. It's it's sad that there's been this period in my lifetime where they've actually dipped down because I grew up where they were the kings and mm-hmm. everybody was shit scared of them, batting or bowling. <laughs> everybody was just shit scared of them. And the bowling... People say to me now, what was it like batting number 11 with a batting average of five or six having to go in and face the second new bowl with Michael Holding or Joel Garner or Kirtley or Courtney? Scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I don't want to get hit and break a finger because I, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get hit. So I'm really focusing on trying to block the ball, but it'd go, and I'd go, shit, that's gone already. And I didn't even have the bat down. So, oh no, that, like was, that was scary. And they just kept producing these people. So I met Brian early and yeah. I knew of his reputation. But I'd watched him bat a few times and the ball coming into him. So right armers were bowling, right arm over the wicket going across him. If they made a mistake of a number of inches, he was just out there with that drive. And he was very good at flicking off his hip. Left arm into him. I saw it as a problem for him. Mm. I told AB that season that they came out, you should get Billy and Merv to bowl around the wicket and into his pads. No, that wasn't, that was my idea. So that's a shit idea. <laughs> so I just bowled over the wicket into yeah. his pads. I knocked him over in two or three one days. Mm. And in that Boxing Day test, which was my last test match, Lara, second innings, Lara. I took, I bowled like 12 overs, one for 25 or something in the first innings, Lara. And 10 overs, one for 30 in the second innings, Lara. Mm. I said, I told you, get him to bowl around the wicket and push him in. But as Brian's career continued on, he sorted that out. He made I've got to make, I've got to make this statement now. When I knocked over Tendulkar and Lara, they were only young men. <laughs> <laughs> they were unbelievable, but still learning the game. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, people ask me, oh, did you ever, get, oh yeah, I got them out. Yeah. But like Sachin was 19 yeah. and Brian was a young man, but a well, question just dropped, dropped in my head then. So you got Tendulkar, Lara, you're bowling to absolute gods of the game. Best, among the names, best ever to pick up a bat. What about Viv in his heyday? Yeah. Viv Richards. Was yeah. he the hardest to bowl to or was it someone else? So no, nah, they were, they were brutal and ruthless. And you got to think about it this way. Like Greenwich and Haynes would soften the bowling attack up mm. for Richie Richardson to come in mm. and then he'd belt the shit out of you and then Viv would come in. Mm. That was at the back end of Viv's career. That the front end of his career was batting three. So whoever opened the, the batting would belt the bat, the bowlers around and soften them up <laughs> for Viv to come in. The thing I respected about Viv was things like this. He never wore a helmet. He never owned a helmet. I asked him one day, no helmet in my kit with us. No helmet in his kit ever. I saw him get hit a few times, like Hoggy hit him badly in Melbourne mm. and he just went like this, pushed his thing, put the cap back on and then hit Hoggy 15 rows back the next <laughs> ball when he bowled him another bouncer. Just fearless. <laughs> and his build yeah. was bowling balls on his shoulders and just like strong man yeah. and wanted to dominate. And I'll say this, I've had a lot of conversations with Viv and there was a, a period of time there where you know, they really wanted to push the black power thing mm. forward, particularly after Tony Gregg said to them in England that too, we're going to make them grovel. Yeah. Greggy went, they're coming over here. We'll make them grovel. Well, that was a very big mistake. Michael Greggy. Holding used to, his bowling run-up used to go around the back of the sites. I screen. know. <laughs> I played one <laughs> county game against Michael Holding, my last county game for Gloucester at Lancashire. Yeah. And he was pushing off the side screen oh and goodness. I had to go in and bat. Oh. And the first one was like that. It was sort short of a length and went past. And I wasn't even, I hadn't had the bat up and I just felt this <laughs> and a breeze. <laughs> and then I turned around 
the keeper's already caught it. It's a gully <laughs> on the way back. And then, do you know, have you got, I've got two people, the one on your right shoulder is the good guy, get behind the ball. Yeah, and, yeah. and the one on the left's going, run, get out of the way. run, <laughs> live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, mate, I, that was the first, that was 81 after playing those test matches and playing for Gloucester was my last game. And I hadn't faced anybody like that. And after two balls, mm. the first one, and the next one's the in swing or the, the driven in York at a middle and leg, which I just completely missed and it knocked both stumps out. And I thought, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> if that's the pace of these guys, I'm just gone, mate. I'm never going to be able to do that. And I remember walking off. He'd hit our captain, Andy Stovold, in the head. And Andy was in the Manchester infirmary. <laughs> And he's walking off and I looked at Michael. I went, glad you didn't bowl that first one at my head, Michael. He went, me too. One batsman in hospital <laughs> in one day is enough wit. <laughs> he knew. And I had no helmet on. Yeah. No arm guard. No, those things weren't invented in 1980. I went to pick the helmet up and Stuart Broad's father, Chris Broad, who played 50 <laughs> tests for England, he was playing for Gloucester. He went, oh, wait, you're not wearing the helmet. I'm looking out, Michael Holdings waiting there. I went, you're joking. He said, oh, Greggy's like, Tony Gregg's the one that wears the helmet. So I left the helmet in the dressing room. <laughs> I didn't want to be put in the Tony Gregg category <laughs> at the time. Because Greggy was regarded as a bit of a wanker back then. Mm. 80, 81, you know, he was outspoken, great player. And then had the rest of his life out here, of course. But yeah, it was crazy. Have you seen this documentary? Mitch, no. Fire in Babylon. Oh. It was. It's about the Windies in the seventies, yeah, and that features heavily the, the Tony Gregg. What about when Viv that? in that goes and I, 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 you know, I think that there was some, you know, other things happening in England, some undercurrents, and things like that, which was talking about the English hierarchy not wanting the West Indies yeah. to beat England. Hmm. You know, they, you know, they it would have been embarrassing, wouldn't it? Well, there was a bit of a there was a bit of a they, swell they, underneath they that politically gave it to as well, because yeah. there was a lot of West Indian immigration into England at that was. time. So yeah. there was a bit of that yeah. uh, stuffy. Yeah, and Greggy only had to say, "We'll make them grovel." Oh, and yeah. Clive Lloyd apparently just said, "Okay, going to make us grovel." Watch this. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> deadly, vicious stuff. Yeah. Um, you got some TV questions for your old favourite show? Well. Yeah, a few. I mean, I'm just Mitch hasn't had a lot to this. say, actually. <laughs> <laughs> None of us have. Yeah. Yeah. I've been living this. No, it was more like how how did you end up in these amazing roles? Obviously, your cricket career shot you to start. You mentioned that a few times, but then how? Uh, because there wasn't a lot of money in cricket, and I didn't want to – I did an apprenticeship at Qantas as a ground engineer, so I'm an aircraft maintenance engineer by study. And I wanted to get more qualifications there, but that wasn't going to suit a sporting life. Mm. Remember the day I left Qantas and I walked in the back door and <laughs> said to mum, I've left Qantas. Oh, her face just, <laughs> because it was a great place to work in those days. It was mm. a credit union, superannuation, long service leave. You could fly around the world for 10% of an airfare and it was just fantastic. But I said, I, she said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to be, try and be a professional cricketer. And her answer was, is there such a thing? <laughs> I said, there is in England, but anyway, so I started speaking, coaching and had these sort of income streams so I could play cricket mm. and the money that I got from cricket. Um, but I was doing a lot of speaking and I just retired and I was sort of working in an office with some guys in North Sydney doing some promotions. And this guy rang me and said, I'm making a show on the ABC and I saw you speak at this function last week and I thought you were really funny. And your comedic timing was really good. I thought, what's that? <laughs> comedic timing. And he said, the host of this show is not going to be able to do it. It's 13 episodes, which I didn't realize at the time, but that's a series, quarter of a year. Hmm. And I want you to host the show. So I went and saw this guy, David Flatman, and the show was called Great Ideas. It was about Australian innovation and invention. So the Victor Lawnmower and all the old inventions and all these new ones as well. So I made those. And then a bloke who was running Channel 7, Chris Chapman, had played for University of New South Wales with Henry and all these guys there and batted number three and was a fine player. He was now the, the boss at Channel 7 at Epping. Mm. And he rang me up and said, I've seen this stuff you've done on the ABC. Why don't you come out and see me? So I drove out there and I saw him at Epping and he said, we'd love you to do sport. Now, 
this was a big moment in my life, mm. a really big moment. You don't know at the time, but on reflection. I said to him, I don't want to do sport. He went, why not? I said, every sportsman retires and does sport. Mm. And he had a coat rack in the corner with a couple of coats and a few hats on it, and one was a bowler hat. And he said, well, what do you want to do? So I stood up and I got this bowler hat off the coat rack and around his office I went, da 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 Flung the thing and it landed back on there. Like, what a fluke. He goes, oh, widow, what do you want to do, entertainment? I went, yeah. He said, no, no sportsmen do that. I said, that's why I want to do it. He said, we've started a show called Sydney Weekender. It's done about 10 episodes. You can learn the ropes of hosting on that show and then we'll see what we want to do. Do you want to read the news and all? I was like, oh, I don't know, mate, but I don't want to do sport. Mm. So that was the start. And I started on January the 1st, 1995. What they didn't know then is that I fell in love with Sydney Weekender. I did it for the next 27 years. But very soon, Who Dares Wins and Gladiators mm. popped up. And at the time, I didn't realise this now, but that was right at the cutting edge of reality TV. I mean, the first year, mm. three years of Who Dares Wins, we were nominated for a Logie in the entertainment category. The word reality TV didn't exist in the yeah, first yeah. three years. So they were amazing shows to work on. I've got to apologise now for some of the shit that's on in reality TV now. I watch it now and I go, oh, how's that a show? Like, it's just weird. People just abusing each other or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But we were at the cutting edge of that and the guys who made both those shows were very clever. I mean, um, Gladiators was imported from the UK, but Who Dares Wins was made here. So it was basically, from memory, it was just going up to randoms in the street and going, I'll give you 50 bucks to do this challenge. And yeah. There was, that was, was so like cool. the shopping, the shopping <laughs> it was mall so cool. thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'll dare you $50 to eat a sheep's eyeball yeah. or yeah. eat the hottest chili on planet Earth or skull a blood milkshake. Whatever they came up with, like I'd go into the office and look at the whiteboard and go, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, Come on, you sickos. So there was a $50 dare, then a, a $100 to $200 dare, which we could set up in a mall as well. Mm. And then there was the big dare, mm. the main dare, which if you succeeded in that, you went on a world holiday. So how, the, this was the problem. I'd be walking down the street and I'd get attacked by a thousand blokes going, I'll do anything. <laughs> but what they didn't know was this. If your Mrs. Adam had yeah. written in about you, you know, we, we love Adam, my, my husband, the three kids, we love him. But he watches your show every week and tells my children he could do any dare <laughs> on the show. He needs a holiday. He works too hard, whatever. So... We'd get 10,000 letters like that every week. Yeah. The girls in the office would go through that letter and they'd go, oh, this sounds nice, Adam and his wife, whatever. They'd then go and meet your wife, mm. unbeknownst to you, and get a feeling about her being on camera and Adam doesn't know, but what's his greatest fear? Yeah. <laughs> and they'd say spiders or heights. So for the dude watching the show, that mightn't have been their greatest fear yeah. and that wasn't projected enough to the audience that this is the bloke's greatest fear. So we'd throw him into that situation and if he was good and did the dare, they went on a holiday around the world. If he didn't do the dare, he was never allowed back in the pub with his mates <laughs> yeah. because they said you're a weak wanker. Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. Dare would, what dare would you hate um, if that show was around right there now? There was a skydiving one that springs to mind because that terrifies the bejesus out of me. Um, you haven't had a, uh, a nah. jump yet out of a plane? It scares oh. me. But I remember one of the episodes when I was growing up and I was like, nah. And I think the guy went through with it. I felt like you did the skydive, but, um, yeah, he went through with it and I was like, no, nah, I didn't never want to Well, that do was that. the thing that people didn't realize either. If you, the punter failed, then it got thrown to me or Tanya who were hosting the show. Yeah. And then if we failed or didn't want to do it, a stunt man completed it yeah. to show that it could be done. So I'm taking you out at a monsoon and I'm going, <laughs> I'm saying to you, you better do this, mate. They won't let you back in the pub. You'll be called the weakest so-and-so, hoping that you did it because yeah. I didn't want to do it. Some rope dangling over the Blue Mountains with a little pissy harness on it or, or a rope across a crocodile pond in Cairns that if you fall off the rope, you're knee high in the water. <laughs> And there's a hundred crocs down there and they're going, oh, but it's the middle of winter. They're not really active. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you get on the road. Oh, I was, and as you would expect to, as the first year went on into the second year, 
what was a big deal in year one yeah. became a fifty dollar dare in year two. Yeah, yeah. it got more extreme. It got more <laughs> yeah. extreme, and they just what about one day I walk in and they go, man feed shark off uh, off the Great Barrier Reef with uh, chain mail glove on. So one of the big bosses here because producers in there, I go, how big's the glove? He goes, oh, just there. I go, what about the shark takes his fucking arm off? The glove's not even going to register. So we went up there two days to get out of the outer reef on this boat. Yeah. And we dived out there and this dude fed white tip, grey tip and black tip sharks. And when there's a bit of a feeding frenzy on, and, you know, they're, they're yeah. decent, so five to six feet, they go into this other mode, attack mode, and it was crazy. But he fed this fish and I'm thinking, oh, don't. Don't take his hand off. <laughs> don't, don't take his whole hand off. But you we're could, right. You would never get away with that these yeah, days. No right? way. No. And that's what finished the show. After yeah. three or four years, there was a very big insurance company that collapsed in Australia. FIA? Yes. Yeah. And they were insuring the show and they said, we're going to go into a hiatus. <laughs> no wonder. Yeah. Some of those guys actually went to jail with, from FIA. Yeah. And, Rodney Adler? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then when they came back to make the show again, the insurance premiums had like times 10. I bet. Yeah. So they then sold it around the world and made it in other countries around the world and, and did really well Mate, with the, it. the dare I wouldn't do would be face Mulga Holding in 1975. <laughs> 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 would be my one. I didn't realise it was a dare, but it was. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh, my God. Hey, I think we've got a, uh, a special guest as well who's in for a uh, another episode of Willow Talk. It's the great Mark Taylor, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So, Tubby, you, you obviously know this man very, very well. Far too well. Where, of course, far too well. Where was the – because I'm, I'm thinking this guy, especially back in the day with the big fro and everything like that, makes an impression immediately on people. Can you remember early doors, the great wit? Oh, yeah. Oh, I can remember sort of making my way into the New South Wales state squad. Oh, God, I'm showing my age now, about 1982 or three or something yeah. like that as a, yeah. an 18, 19-year-old. Um, and there was wit um, – Dave Gilbert, Jeff Lawson, they were the sort of the three quicks. And then there was Greg Matthews, Maui Matthews. They were the sort of the, my recollection, sort of the four senior guys. There was obviously the, the Dirk Wellams and what have you, who was captain mm. at that time. But the, they, they were like the guys, you, as a batter, particularly an opening batter, you're walking into your first net session, you look up and you see Henry, Witt, Dave Gilbert, and then Greg Matthews. They were the ones you wanted to try and impress. I think one of the first balls I received at state training hit me on the back left heel. A big inswinger from David Liz Gilbert, and I thought, "Wow, I'm, I shouldn't be here. I'm, I'm not good enough." That was my initial thoughts. But I do remember that that it wasn't daunting because they were good lads. You know, mm. they they made all of us young guys feel very welcome. But it was a bit of a one of those moments where you think, "Oh, I'm not sure I'm quite up to that standard," and you weren't. Mm. But that's what you sort of had to you had to get yourself up to that standard to prove you could play. Uh, cult figure as well, is it fair to say, back in your playing days? Oh, yeah. Guy? Yeah, he was doing what, two his ads back in those days. <laughs> That's got to mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do, do and, uh, you know, and we were sponsored by two his back in those days. And I do remember that. It's one of the first things I got was a light blue t um, track suit. And a two his t-shirt. Oh, yeah, <laughs> big time. You can walk around the street with a yeah. two his t-shirt. You know? <laughs> it's huge, you know? <laughs> Well, I said earlier, Tub, remember we weren't allowed to leave the dressing room until the eskies were empty. Oh, no. And then playing for Australia, the Benson Hedges bloke would come in <laughs> and drop 50 cartons on the table. <laughs> I felt deprived. I wasn't smoking. Yeah. I, I never liked smoking. <laughs> no. and, I, and this guy would come in with a big brown bag, He's Benson Hedges, yeah. and just start throwing these 10 packs in. And you Booney, know? Booney would sort of catch about five. <laughs> <laughs> That's one for me, old man, and Uncle Cedric. And he'd be smoking. I always sat in the dressing room next to Booney. And I love telling these stories. He came off at the SCG one day, and I was 12th man. It might have been Shane's first test, actually, at the SCG. Mm -hmm. Warnie's yeah. first test. And I was 12th man. And he's walked in. He's pulled the gloves off and the helmet. Then he's lit the first one, mm -hmm. Bernie. And he's gone. <laughs> like, it's gone down halfway <laughs> with the first drag. Yeah. He's the number one batsman ranked in the world <laughs> at this stage. So then he puts that in the ashtray next to me. And he pulls the pads off and then he has another really big suck and then lights the second one <laughs> off that one. There's already 10 in the ashtray. I think about it now, Tom. Oh, like, we, oh, it's just bizarre Imagine to think the about SSC it. Coach. <laughs> Man, it's just now. bizarre to think about it that half the team smoked in the dressing uh, room. Well, the other one that comes to mind for me was Mark O'Neill. 
Fine player, Sparky O'Neill, we call him. Mm. Loved, loved the lo- durry. Loved, loved, loved oh, the smoke. Yeah, loved the durry. He made a magnificent, I would, 130, 140 against Queensland at the Gabba on a stinker. A really hot day. Good batting pitch, but I think Rackerman, I think actually maybe even Tomo might have been playing back in those days. Sparky played so well. Made 130, 140, but it was hot. And he wasn't the fittest guy uh, in Australian cricket <laughs> at the time. And he had a smoker's cock. <laughs> <laughs> we walked off the field and we were sat him down in the old change rooms at the Gabba and we're helping him to get his pads off because mm. he was that fatigued. <laughs> and then, and all he could do was reach around, reach find his bag, gaspers. pull out a smoke. And, and as Whit just brilliantly explained, just sucked this, uh, this smoke and took in half of it. <laughs> That's the first thing he did before he had a glass of water. It was a smoke first oh and then God. the water after. And then when they breathed it out, I used to say this to Bernie, go, <laughs> <laughs> this smoke. And I'd go, you really enjoyed that, didn't you? <laughs> and he'd go, yep, yep, yep. Well, the interesting thing now is the Australian women's cricket team, known as a, just a bunch of cereal vapors. So, uh, <laughs> uh, no. Who said that? No, no, well, no, it's funny, it but my introduction to cricket in, um, we had like a, they were called Brewer Shield at the time. It was like an under 18 slide, but we were all 13, 14. Mm. We went up to play third grade the next year because we won Brewer Shield. And there's a bunch of 13, 14 year old girls playing at Birch Grove. On the vapes? No. <laughs> no. Oh, we played at a side. I can't remember who it was, but one of the older ladies that played in opposition was like making runs for fun. And at the mm. drinks break, we'd call for a cigarette. So yeah. she'd be like, bring me a cigarette at the drinks break. And we're 13, 14, like. <laughs> Is this normal? But it turns out it was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Very normal. Very normal. <laughs> anyway, um, we, it's been educational. It's been fun. One last one, actually. This is stuck in my mind. And, and Tubby, you, you might have been captain this night. I'm not sure. The SCG, the Hill, this was in the dying days of the Hill before they kind of sanitized it to the point where now that it's a massive grandstand. But it, it was getting a bit rowdy. And. I think you, I don't know if you were actually playing or Australia were batting, but you came out of the dressing room to tell the crowd yeah. to chill out a bit. Were, yeah. you, were you playing that night? I, oh, I can't sure. recall. Maybe I wasn't. Might be before. He's a lot older than me. So the, the cult older. hero had to come out and act as the police <laughs> all of a sudden. What yeah. the hell? Yeah. I don't know why I even did that. And they settled down. I was expecting cans to be thrown from the... I remember once at the MCG, you've just reminded me from another thing, I'm furling down at fine leg. It's a one day, I think you possibly could have been playing. It was the early 90s, I think. And I hear this, shung. And I look there and a banana's landed. <laughs> I'm down at, at, at in front of Bay 13 and I'm trying to be friends with them. Yeah. It's all right when you're playing for Australia. If you're back as New South Wales a week really? later, you're the biggest arsehole. <laughs> and I'm going, at, from last week, it was me. Anyway, at, at the next delivery, I sort of picked the banana up and it's a goodie. So I've pearled it. <laughs> And I've had a couple of bites and they're all talking about that. Then I threw the half of it in the gutter. Then 37 tons of fruit <laughs> got thrown. They had to stop the game. And then one, I kept walking in because the fruit's coming down. And then I hear this boom on the ground. And I look around. It's a frozen chicken. <laughs> So I say, who the fuck brings a frozen chicken <laughs> to a one-day game at the MCG to throw it on the ground? <laughs> so they had to clear all this stuff back, and I had to play with them that night. Please, we can't. Don't stop the game. Right then. And blokes got an apple. <laughs> it's crazy. So, yeah, it was what the, I love the crowd. The crowd was fun, except in Western Australia when we played for New South Wales. Yeah, right? they didn't like us. They didn't like us out there. We right. didn't like them either. This has been an education for all our listeners, <laughs> including two of us. All the young room. blokes will go, is that how they played in the old days? Like the crazy. guys down at Randwick Perdition are lucky to have you around and, and still involved with the present there. You obviously love cricket. Thanks so much for being a part of Will. Thanks, Adam. My pleasure, mate. Thanks, Mitch. Good to see you, mate. Good to see you. And you too, Tubbs. <laughs> Cheers, mate. More Willow Talk soon. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.